Welcome to another episode of the Founder Hour Podcast. I'm your co-host, Pat. Today's episode is with Andrew Dudem, founder and CEO of Hims and Hers. Founded in 2017, Hims and Hers is a telehealth company that sells prescription and over-the-counter drugs online, as well as personal care products. Their mission is to eliminate the stigmas around health and wellness issues and break down barriers for people when it comes to obtaining quality health care. The company debuted on the New York Stock Exchange in January of this year and is currently valued at about $2.5 billion. We spoke with Andrew about his early days growing up in San Francisco and what some of his early passions were, his experience going to college at Wharton as well as his early career, what sparked the idea for him and the problems he saw with healthcare, the early challenges he faced while building the business, why he decided to take the company public via SPAC merger, and much more. Here we go. Yeah, so I grew up in San Francisco. Um, I was the oldest son of... uh... Uh, father and grandfather and great grandfather who were all kind of entrepreneurs. They all started their own business. They, um, you know, I grew up kind of in each of their businesses, whether it was a laundromat or a law office or a real estate company. Um, so kind of grew up with this mentality of kind of just scrappiness and you know, immigrant family and do it yourself. And so as a young kid, I, you know, my, my first entrepreneurial journey, I guess, thing I was most interested in was actually music. So um, I wanted to be in a rock band. My mom wouldn't let me. Uh, I wanted to play electric guitar. So she convinced me that if I played cello, that one day I could turn it sideways and be really good at guitar. Yeah. So my earliest kind of passion was music, playing cello. I hustled and uh, created a little quartet where we play at weddings and play on the street down in Union Square in San Francisco. Uh, How old were you? I, I was probably, I started when I was five. Um, wow. And at, at the age of maybe 11 or 12, we were playing weddings, which was a ton of fun. Um, ended up getting pretty good at it, touring to Carnegie Hall in Europe when I was in my teens. Um, and and was really kind of in love with the music side, but you know, d- it didn't really um, quench the thirst of of the business side that my, my family and my brain had as well. So decided to kind of round it off and for college instead of, kind of taking the music route, going going to business school. So went to Penn now in Philly, uh, loved Philly, went to undergrad Wharton uh, and started really surrounding myself with with that side of the world. And, uh, yeah. you know. And before we get into that side, sorry to cut you off, before we get into yeah. that side, I'm curious, you know, as a kid, it sounds like this was something, you know, taking up cello and a musical instrument, it requires a lot of patience, which a lot of kids don't have. Like I, you know, was trying to learn piano when I was a kid and I went to, you know, a year or two years of classes and I just quit because... Once it started getting hard, I just didn't have the patience. I just wanted to go out and play and play sports and that kind of stuff. And usually when when you find, you know, folks who pick up an instrument at such a young age, their parents are the ones that sort of pressure it on them and like make them stick it through and are strict. But it sounds like you just wanted to to do it for yourself. And it's, you know, it's funny, like many, many years later, I've always said I wanted to learn the guitar and I recently picked it up. Yeah. And now I find that I have so much more patience. Like I li- literally like can't wait to whatever, like take online classes and learn this and that. So how did you, I mean, like as a kid, were you just like a patient kid or how did that, I mean, like, I don't know if that was just one instance, but were there other like examples of that too? You know, I think as a, I think that's a really good point. And, and I think as a kid, you know, actually generally in life, I think delayed gratification is probably one of the most valuable skill sets anybody can learn. You know, and as an adult, when I'm looking at resumes for people even applying to hymns, you know, hymns and hers, when I see somebody staying at a company for four years and they've done that three times, it's like, hey, this person's interesting versus mm-hmm. when I see somebody who's been jumping around every six months, like they don't have the capacity to focus and be patient. And I think for me, you know, I wasn't I, I was a hyperactive kid. Um, so I wasn't like this Zen patient kid. My mom, you know, I think just did a really good job of saying, hey, if you care about X, Y and Z, this is one way to get to it. And what I cared about when I was 13 was buying a car. And I loved Toyota 4Runners. And I thought it was the coolest thing in the world that the windows in the back rolled down and you could have like a Toyota 4Runner. So I wanted to save and they made it clear they weren't going to buy me a car. So I needed to figure out how to make money for a car. So from the age of like 13 to 16, I was, you know, playing music on the street, signing up our little quartet for as many weddings as we could making a hundred bucks here, a hundred bucks here and saving up to buy a car. And so I think it was more just, you know, 
being taught that you actually have the control to get what you want. You just have to, you know, go and get it. Um, and I think that was also just culturally in my family, you know, I think just that's just maybe a lot of like the immigrant grit is like, you got to figure out how to get what you want. And I think that was very much instilled in me. And so um, I just put all my effort towards that one thing, which was getting a car. I ended up not even yeah. liking Forerunners by the time I was 16 and I bought like an Acura. Um, but I think that that was like a, an important lesson for me. Andrew, one thing I'm curious about is, you know, a lot of people, obviously, as kids, they don't know what their lives are going to look like, right? They don't know, you know, what they're going to end up doing with their life. So it's tough to ask you, you know, what were you planning on doing as an adult, right? Adults ask all the time, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? But what I'm more curious about is what did the adults around you say about you when you were, you know, 10, 12, 14, right? Were you... Did they call you a confident kid? Did they call you an interesting kid? Did they call you a shy kid? What would the others around you say about you? I, I think they they would have called me a um, <clears throat> maybe a, a, a mature kid. You know, I was even in stature. You know, when I was in seventh grade, I was like five ten, and you know, one hundred and fifty pounds. Right, and I was like a fully grown human now my basketball career when I was in seventh grade was like sick. I was scoring like 30 points, but then my freshman year in high school when everyone else grew, I was like the worst kid on the the team. So I haven't grown since like seventh grade, (laughs) but you know, when I was in those early years, you know, I looked older. Um, I, I was very comfortable with adults. I was very comfortable with teachers. I was the, you know, the class president in high school. I was running clubs um, in high school you know, interacting with different organizations. So I think I was a natural leader just because maybe, uh, you know, of my confidence with adults and my confidence right. in my communication skills um, and my confidence in my own abilities to, to get things done and actually execute on things. And, and how much of that do you think was nature versus nurture? Like you mentioned, obviously, being taller than everyone at that age gives you the sense of confidence. But then you also mentioned the sort of immigrant mindset that your parents perhaps had. Or So like, tell us kind of, I mean, how much do you think it comes naturally to you, like from a young kid as a young uh, you know, kid? Or a lot? how much was it from just getting maybe perhaps some sort of um, validation or assurance from the people around you uh, in school? Yeah, you know, I would, you know, I would probably say you know, it was, um, you know, 40% nature and 60% nurture, right? Like I, there was an instinctive, um, ability there that was consistent with, with, you know, maybe just who I was and, and how I've grown up as an adult. But I also, you know, was really explicitly surrounded by people telling me that I was capable of being independent and almost training me to be independent. And I think even, you know, when you dive down another level, when I was in seventh grade, my dad um, had stage four cancer and we were all really young, right? Like 13, 12, eight, four, like all of the four kids. And so, you know, during this period of time and, you know, thank God he's healthy now, 20 years later, whatever it is. But for those years, you know, he explicitly, um, made an effort of saying, Hey, I'm going to teach you how to be a grown up because there's a really good chance I'm not here to help you be a grown up. Right. So, for a, a very short period of time, and actually probably for the, the next 10 years after that, I had parents and explicitly a father who, you know, I think tried to accelerate my learning phase um, and be very honest with the fact that, you know, you can achieve what you want to do, but you have to put your head down. You have to focus. There might be a situation where, you know, you're the man of the house at 13, mm-hmm. right. Um, and have to take care of your you know, help with your siblings and help your mom or whatever it might be. And so I think that, you know, that reality was maybe just an accelerant to a maturity, you know, dynamic. Yeah. And, and besides that, can you remember like what your sort of outlook on life was at the time? Cause oftentimes, you know, you mentioned going to uh, Wharton and UPenn, um, and, uh, that's obviously one of the best schools in the, in the, in the country, in the world. And, you know, there's this kind of, you know, oftentimes in high school or middle school, you know, people have this like aha moment of where, where I want to take my life. And perhaps they're more 
serious about their grades and they get into better schools and all that good stuff. So did you have this, like, besides p- perhaps your dad's diagnosis and the things that, you know, you had in your personal life, were there other like aha moments that you had at, in that age range where you, you sort of took the reins on your life and, you know, like, I'm not going to mess around. I'm not going to, you know, not take my schooling seriously or college seriously or anything like that. There, there was like, I, I, I think from a young age and probably starting in high school, you know, there were, the, or starting in middle school, the high school that I wanted to go to was hard to get into. And so in like, you know, in fifth grade, I saw my sister go through the process of applying to the high, high school. And I remember, you know, hearing these stories of like, man, I didn't realize my seventh grade, like <laughs> my seventh grade grades would affect me getting into high school. And I was in fifth grade. And I was like, oh shit, like next year matters. And like the year after it matters, like I see my sister struggling with, you know, not being able to get into the school because of this thing in the past. So, so I had this foresight of, of watching people ahead of me. And I always was very determined to prove it to myself, you know, that I could accomplish things I wanted. And I wanted to get into a certain high school and I did. And then I wanted to go to Stanford. Um, you know, I was a, a local San Francisco kid. Stanford was the school you hear about. You know, to be honest, I had not heard of the school Wharton until I got in to Wharton, um, which is like people think there's a joke. But like when you're in San Francisco coming from you know an immigrant family, it's not a school you know. Maybe if you're from New York, East Coast, you've heard about it. But I wasn't exposed. So I, I got waitlisted at Stanford and I was pissed. Um, and my dad was like, hey, but you got into this other school that's, you know, that seems like a good business school too. So I looked up that and I was like, oh, that's, that seems like a good one too. So I decided to go there, right? But um, there was this, and luckily, thank God, it's a great school, of course. But, you know, I had this goal of Stanford and that pushed me really hard um, to try to get in. Now, after I got into school, I was burnt out. You know, I um, barely went to class. I was building things on the side. I was like, hey, I'm not a, turns out I'm not a Wharton guy. I'm not Goldman. I'm not a finance guy. I don't like this stuff. So I need to figure out a new path. So I was academically totally burnt out, but I did have a lot of academic focus to try to get to those milestones. Andrew, before we talk about, you know, those times and, you know, what you did in college and what you did after, you know, you mentioned something about having to grow up faster than most due to the fact that your father uh, you know, had that illness, uh, and you know, a time like that or a moment like that can cause folks to have to grow up early, especially as kids. You know, loss of a father, a mother, or sibling, whatever the case may be, a tragic situation. Um, but um, I want to know what your thoughts are on for for those people that don't necessarily have a tragic situation in their family or friend life but do want to go ahead and go faster. You know, how do you, how does one either force themselves or trick their minds or place themselves in an environment where they do get ahead of the curve, right? Because I think a lot of people these days want to get ahead. Perhaps they don't have the resources, perhaps they don't have the know-how, but I want to know what your thoughts are based on your experiences. You know, I, I think, um, I think one of the best, the biggest advantages somebody could have is no money and no connections, frankly, in this day and age. And there's no, there's no surprise that when you look at, you know, financial returns and startup returns, a lot of those people are immigrants, right? Who have nothing when they come to this country to start those businesses. Um, They just have a killer work ethic and they have the ability to put their head down and be gritty as hell and say, I'm going to every day inch my way closer. And I think a big like tactical thing that I think some of the best people do that I've seen is they, they start um, to get mentors and they start to hustle to find people who are actually closer to where they want to be than where they are. And they start surrounding themselves with those people and learning from those people and building a network of those people and Ultimately, what ends up happening is one of those people take you under your wing, their wing, right? Did, did you of, have those people? Did you have those no certain mentors? 
no question. Yeah. You know, how, how did you find these people? I mean, were they through like school or because you know, mentorship yeah. is obviously like everyone knows. I mean, most people I feel like know that it's a it's a positive thing to have in your life, but I think the process of getting the right mentors are not as easy. You know, I, I think I think most people miss the obvious thing, which is just like bug the hell out of somebody until they pick up your call. Right. Like there's these, there, there's these old stories where like Steve Jobs would like literally would like open up the phone book and like call the CEOs of these big tech companies of his day. And they we just had Nolan Bushnell, the founder of Atari on the show. And he said that Steve Jobs literally walked into his office and said, I'm not leaving until you give me a job. That's right. Basically. So that's it was like, right. it was like, just like that. Yeah, that's right. So, you know, one of my co-founders at Hims, his name is Joe Spector, um, immigrant, um, from Russia, he walked into my office four years ago and said that exact same thing. And I was like, who are you? You're crazy. Like I, we're not even hiring. And he's like, I'm literally not leaving until you give me any job, like anything. And we gave him a job and it's like, man, this guy's awesome. This guy gets shit done. And he, you know, mm-hmm. I had him help me co-found the business, right. Four years, four years later. So I think, you know, what I did was back in the day, um, and you can still do this today. I just started reaching out to people on Twitter. I literally would message if you go back to probably my Twitter feed from like 2009 or 2008, I was messaging, messaging VCs. I was messaging entrepreneurs. I was asking to jump on zoom or not zoom Skype calls. Right. I was asking to like message them. And so many of those people I work with today, every single day. And a lot of them don't even remember that the first time we met, it was me as a kid pinging them on like Twitter or LinkedIn trying to get a meeting. Right. And I think um, what comes before that is actually kind of knowing what you're even seeking, right? Who, who you're seeking, what type of person you're seeking, what industry they're in. Yeah. And, and, and so you mentioned being at Wharton and not really, because I went to undergrad business school too, and everyone in my class wanted to go to invest in banking or consulting and those routes. And so for someone that wanted something different, right, perhaps it's becoming an entrepreneur or something else within the business realm. What did you envision like life would look like after college for you? I mean, did you, I know you ended up starting a company pretty much, I don't know if it was in college or right after, but um, did you just say like, I want to be an entrepreneur. I'm just going to reach out to anyone who has their own business and learn that way. No, I was really, um, I was able to narrow it down pretty quickly to technology design startup world. Like I got to Warren and I knew quickly I was not Goldman. I hated that. I hated those classes. I hated that vibe. I didn't want to live in New York. Um, and so I just, I like opted out. And so because of that, you know, my, my mindset has always been, if I'm not going to do what everyone else does and be the best as, at it, I need to pick something else and be the best at that. So in my brain, I picked startups. I was like, I love this idea of bypassing like rigid bureaucracy and having like this merit-based system where anybody could build something awesome and prove it. Right. And I love that. Cause I was like, I'm just, that's me betting on myself and I'll bet on myself any day. Like I love that. So what, what examples did you see or, or were you exposed to at the time that made you feel like this is something that I can do and this is possible? Well, I, mean, I think, I think Warren in particular had, um, you know, there was things going on at the time that allowed for it. So Warren had had the, um, some of the early founders come out of it. You had like the Harry's guys when I was at school, they were MBAs, you know, getting going on Harry's razor, razor company. Right. Um, Elon Musk had graduated from, from Warren and, and that those stories were like in the halls. Right. Um, so PayPal was like th- those conversations of PayPal, the conversations of venture capital of people graduating. I'm trying to remember, um, there was a few VCs that had graduated from Warren and were out in San Francisco starting funds. Um, Josh Koppelman was one of them. I remember, you know, and they had books. And so I was reading their books and it's just, it was like in the school era of like this entrepreneurial vibe, um, that was kind of a new thing, but it was also really attractive. So I just started learning from all of those guys and started to reach out to all of them. Um, and I think that's kind of what triggered the whole thing. Andrew, did you, you know, during your time in Philadelphia, you know, were you involved with any startups there during your time in college just to kind of learn about what you're interested in, what you're not interested in, what industries kind of speak to you, or perhaps even just opportunities out there that you may end up pursuing long term? Yeah, I did a ton of stuff 
Yeah, I, absolutely. I, um, you know, I, I joined with a, a kid in Warren who was building a microfinance uh, nonprofit um, and helped him build that for a couple of years, which I loved. I loved doing. It was super altruistic, but I didn't love the nonprofit world. I actually felt like the incentives for attracting really great people and building big things wasn't there. So it was a great learning experience. Um, I, there was a ton of projects of people starting up little, you know, side gigs and projects I would work on. My buddy started a restaurant, you know, that I helped him with, um, hated the restaurant industry, saw how hard he was working, how late he was working, you know, how, how much, how he had no leverage on his time, you know, and, and that bugged me. So I was constantly playing around with ideas and finding people that were playing around with ideas and trying to help them out just to get a, a sense of what it was. And ultimately, um, you know, I reached out to somebody on Twitter to meet them because they were a founder in one of the spaces for one of the projects I was working on. And he was like, Hey man, I run this company in San Francisco, this startup called Talkbox. It was a Sequoia company. And he's like, I need somebody to, we have like this internship over the summer. We need somebody to help. Like maybe you should apply. And I applied and ultimately got it. And that was really the first, you know, established role in kind of this world that I had. And I didn't even know that the word product manager was a role. Like he, he and, you know, the chief marketing officer were the first people in my life that said, Hey, you love building stuff. You love designing stuff. You can actually make that a job. And this is what the role is. So for those that might not, you know, be in the tech or startup scene, what, what does that entail, right? Product design or product manager. What is that? The best way I was described, you know, that role was essentially a mini CEO. You know, you're a mini CEO for a specific business line or a specific product. So that means you're responsible for the strategy of what's going to get built, um, what the customer is going to buy, how much it's going to cost. Um, you're in charge of how it's positioned, how it's going to go to market, um, and making sure it's making money. Right. And you're not the CEO of the big company, but you you're the CEO of kind of this little company and even harder than a CEO. Essentially, nobody reports to you, but it's your responsibility that it gets done. Got it. And did you enjoy that experience there? I mean, and what were the some of the things that you learned in that role that have been valuable to you as a you know founder CEO now years later? Yeah, I loved I loved that role. Um, I I really love that role. And even to this day, you know, anybody that works at Hims and Hers knows that I spend a ton of time every day working with the product managers, refreshing graphs, looking at metrics, running tests. I mean, that's that's where my passion is. Um, I think what I loved most was combining this creativity of, you know, you have an idea about something that customers want to buy, right? And then you literally can go convince engineers it's an exciting thing to build convince the marketers it's an exciting thing to market and then put it into action two weeks later and look at data and see if you were right. Mm. You know, and that was just like the speed of, of, you know, um, validating an instinct like, Oh, I've got this idea. And actually then like three weeks later being like, and that idea is actually like making us money. It's making us a lot of money or it's not. And it failed created this ability for me to build a pattern recognition and instinct really fast. Yeah. You know, oftentimes um, when someone like, for example, in your case, from a young age or perhaps like when you're in early college days, wants to be an entrepreneur and you're sort of fascinated by this idea of, like you said, kind of just taking on the world and creating something from scratch and hopefully, you know, changing people's lives in the world for the better. um, You're, you know, if anytime you sort of end up in a position where you're not running the company, it's not your company and you're just sort of in a role. you know, you, you you sort of don't see like the light at the end of the tunnel in terms of like your career trajectory, where you sort of want to just like leave, at, you know, at your earliest opportunity and start a business. And so I saw that you were there for about like three, four years in that product role, and then you ended up starting your own company. Was that because you saw an opportunity that you just wanted to go after? Or was it because you just wanted to start your own company and you went about it for that reason? Um. You know, the, the CEO of the company I was at, I think, you know, knew, um, right. He's the C- currently he's the CEO of Evernote. He's a, one of my greatest mentors back then, um, t- 
told me that you never want to run away from a role. You never want to run away from where you're working because you hate it, because you're done with it, you're tired of it. You want to run towards somewhere because you're excited about it, right? So I had always taken that advice really seriously, and I stayed at that company until there was something exceptionally exciting for me to run towards. And I think a lot of people, you know, would have left probably a lot earlier because after a year you get bored, you know, you, you need to switch it up or, you know, the role is not as exciting as you thought, or you're not getting as much responsibility as you thought. But I was just there. I was like, until I find something I'm insanely excited about doing, I'm going to stick it out. And I think and that's the reason why I Yeah. Like. And the reason I asked that is because, you know, I feel like a lot of people, again, who want, who have this like in their mind that they want to be entrepreneurs, they just start a business just for the sake of starting a business. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't because they didn't perhaps start it for the right reasons. And so, and so for you, like, you know, did, how did you go about finding opportunities? I mean, did it just sort of come to you? Cause or was it something that you um, educated yourself in whatever the industry was and, um, you know, kind of put yourself in the position to be able to start the company? You know, I think you make your own luck. So you're always, you're always, um, you're always giving yourself more shots at find, at, at, like being in a position to find and fall in love with that unique idea. Um, and so what I was doing was networking like crazy. While I was at this company, I was like, this is a great home base. I'm learning, but I'm going to go meet a ton of other entrepreneurs, learn about a ton of other industries, read a ton of other books. And, and I invested a lot of time in talking with other entrepreneurs that I thought were better entrepreneurs than I was. And that would mean like convincing them to get coffee with me or convincing VCs to get coffee with me while I was at this gig. Now, it turns out 10 years later, um, maybe 15 years later, a lot of those people I now work with today. So it was like incredibly valuable to do 15 years ago. And, um, and one of those people was a guy named Jack Abraham, who had also left Warren, who I had kind of latched on to as a mentor, reached out to him. He was, you know, a good advisor to me. And ultimately he was like, Hey, I've got this idea for this fund called Atomic. What do you think? Like, do you want to work on it with me? And it was like, boom, that's it. That's interesting. Like it, it stood out as a unique thing, but the thing I was doing was just constantly trying to meet new people and and learn from them and build a network of opportunities that could eventually blossom. Andrew, you mentioned you know the phrase you know or or the sentence that you were looking to meet with people that were better entrepreneurs than you. What were the qualities that you considered in a better entrepreneur or just even a good entrepreneur at the time? Um, that, you know, piqued your interest in just saying, hey, you know, I'd love to get to know you better. I'd love to pick your brain a little bit. What, who were those people, right? Not specifically, but the types of people that they were. You know, they, they were people that had, had um, done all of the core entrepreneurial things that I had never done, which was raise money from venture capitalists, um, launch products where, you know, TechCrunch had written about them. You know, somebody in technology had, had noticed it. Um, they had written a book on entrepreneur entrepreneurship. They had worked at a venture capital firm that I'd heard about and read about. Um, so it was like one of those things. They would either raised money, they had either invested money uh, and built something from those things, or they had really built something that had an exit. Right? right. Like back in the early 2000s, it was like, you know, I built this company, I sold it for 50 million bucks. And it was like, that was the biggest thing that ever happened back then. Right. And there was a lot of people at that time that had done that, right? These numbers now of taking- That's like a public, series A now. Yeah, that's like a series A. <laughs> back then, like if a, com- if a founder had started a company, raised 10 million bucks and sold it for 50 or 100, it was like you had accomplished success. Right. Silicon Valley, at least in my young mind. But, but you mentioned so. So you mentioned starting Atomic um, after a few years working in product at the startup, and and I'm, I'm assuming Atomic was like a venture fund, right? Um, and you were investing in startups, or was it more like an accelerator? Or it was actually both? it was kind of it was a venture fund that we uh, it was more of a studio model, and it still is a studio model where we raise a large fund, and the fund still exists today and is, is um, continues to build. But then we build our own ideas from scratch. So we use that money to invest in our own ideas and found companies from scratch internally. 
Got it. And for someone that, you know, had some product experience, but no, you know, venture experience or finance experience or anything like that, how did you feel or did you feel confident even going out there and raising money? And how did you know what you were doing? <laughs> I didn't. I didn't. So that was that was the beautiful part of like the networking and the investment and relationships that I had done is I I met a founder, Jack Abraham, who was one of the best storytellers and fundraisers I'd ever met. Um, and he had raised money from all these VCs and he knew them and they respected him. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. This guy has so much to teach me. And I was the guy and I knew my position at that point. I was like, I was the guy that could help this guy build. Like I'm the one in the weeds looking at the metrics and convincing the engineers it's worth building and, and bringing it to market and testing it and proving it. And so it was this, it was actually just an awareness that, um, Together, there was a really powerful combination with this individual and that we could go do something pretty special. Andrew, give us an example of what made this guy so great, right? You talk about his storytelling ability and the ability to raise money. I mean, is there any specific moment or uh, time that you remember, you know, where you're sitting down with, you know, him and perhaps a group of investors or an investor and like what he said and like what he did to get money? I mean, because a lot of people don't talk about that. We, we've talked to 170 plus founders at this point, And it's always like, oh yeah, we went out and raised $30 million. You know, it's not that easy, right? Even if you know someone to convince someone that you know to give you $30 million, it's not that easy. It's $30 million at the end of the day. Yeah. So I'm really curious about what this guy would do. How, how would he do it? Well, you know, anything I know about raising money. And at this point, I, I don't know how much we've raised probably in total, like close to a billion dollars across all of our companies. Um, I learned from this guy and he's still one of my closest friends to date. Jack, I think, you know, had this unique ability to say really crazy shit to a brilliant person without flinching or without looking without any self doubt or with any lack of comments. He would just say, you know, this company is probably going to be worth two or $3 billion in a few years. And then he would just stop. And this is like a seed fundraise, right? We're like, this is like, you know, there's like four people or, you know, the company had just started, you know, and, and he was out here convincing people that this idea we we're starting was the equivalent of Netflix. And he mm. was saying it without question right. and, and with a confidence that if you didn't believe him, it's almost like, are you, how are you, are you stupid? You don't believe this guy? Like, I, I love that you bring this up because it's something we've talked about many times and it's this like reality distortion field concept yeah. that Steve Jobs clearly, clearly had. And a lot of folks have had it, uh, you know, some good, some not so good, like the Billy McFarlands and the yeah. Elizabeth Holmes of the world. And so in your opinion, based on what you saw from him, what makes the distinction between someone who ends up becoming successful, someone who has that sort of really crazy reality distortion field that can go into a meeting with brilliant minds and say, this is what's going to happen and perhaps even back it up with facts or whatever it might be, or just create enough enthusiasm that people overlook that, but become successful at it versus end up in jail. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's a finer line than I think people know is my, my opinion. Um, I think there is a, there's a degree of um, integrity that is clearly different, right? You can have confidence that you're going to build something that's going to change the world and say it. Um, that's, that's different from lying, right? Explicitly misleading people. And I think some entrepreneurs maybe start with this over exuberance, confidence, this reality distortion field, and then they see their execution falling short and they then choose to lie and mislead because they have no other choice in their brain as opposed to being honest and saying, Hey, it's not working. Right. And so I think that's a really clear line is the integrity, you know, has to exist there. And, and that was clearly, was, was clearly there with what we were doing. Um, and that line was clear. I think the other thing though, that makes people really successful is you have to be able to go in there and say, some something insane and creative and, and confidently, but then you need to be able to go back to the office and be like, all right, guys, so what are the three or four things that needs to get done in order to make that crazy shit possible? We just told this guy we're building a rocket. So yeah. uh, we, need, it out. Like, we need to build a rocket. So like, yeah. what are the three things? Right. right. And, and I think what Jack was really good at um, and made him really special and continues to make him special is he could go, you know, expose that confidence, but then he could come back and he can be like, there are, of this whole business we're talking about, 
there are two or three things that matter that are going to unlock leverage to make what I just said possible. Let's go work on those two or three things. Right. Right. And so he could bring it down. And I think founders that can do that, they can have that external just reality distortion field and then also bring it down to a tactical level and, and focus their teams on the one or two things that matter and can simplify it down to one or two things. Those people are really powerful. Right. Cause sometimes you look at him and be like, this guy, this guy clearly doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about. But then there's people that you go like, this is interesting because, like, you know, like the Elon Musk's of the world, right? Like, he says something where you're like, "There's absolutely no way," and then he comes out and does it, yeah. right? It's like, so the, it's like you said, it's like that, if that integrity is there, some, I mean, you just you just never know, and I think that's the beauty of it, right? Is like yeah. taking a bet on somebody, whether it's investing in their company or in their stocks or whatever. It's just like you never know, but but there, it, it's just such a fine line. Yeah, and I think the people like, if, if you want some pattern recognition, the people that have you know, the characteristics of like wild success have reality distortion field, but without question, but also have like neurotic product obsession, right? Like Steve Jobs went back and he knew that the only thing that mattered is that thing could fit in your pocket and that it was easy to accessible and it was beautiful because people would fall in love with it, right? Or Elon knew that like the car had to be stunning. And when anybody drove it, they had to say, this is the best car that's ever been made, right? And he Mm -hmm. knew those details and felt those details intimately. Um, and so I think it's a combination of those two things. Andrew, after you started Atomic, um, the fund, you know, if, if one were to go down your LinkedIn, you know, positions, they'd see a bunch of different companies. And I assume that these were companies that you guys self incubated through Atomic and funded. You know, what were some of those? Before we, you know, go to hims and hers, what were some of those companies that you guys started and where did those come from? So most of the ideas that we started were ideas, and, and they continue to be at Atomic, ideas that we as partners um, struggle with ourselves and, and want solutions for ourselves. And those ideas have always been the ideas that have kept us most passionate and most interested and you know willing to be gritty. And, and obviously, as we were talking about, those things really matter in determining success. So we decided to say, hey, we're going to work on things we really care about. So you know, ideas that that we have built our ideas we wanted in, in the world. One of them was, um, you know, an idea to help us build companies faster. We were out here in Silicon Valley building companies and we kept struggling with trying to f- hire all these engineers because Facebook and Google kept paying them crazy amounts of money. And we're like, we can't build our companies without engineers. So we decided to build a company that helps companies hire engineers. Right. And it's called Terminal and it's raised, you know, a ton of money. It's an amazing company. It goes all around the world um, and, and builds engineering hubs in Mexico and Canada and, and Europe, attracts the best engineering talent and then connects them with companies in the valley so that they can work with these high quality startups. And then all of a sudden we're able to build much faster. So, you know, everything we founded was stuff that I think we personally really wanted in the world. And what's that process look like? I mean, is it just kind of you and your co-founders or just people you work with just sitting around coming up with ideas? And then once once you sort of execute it, you find someone who's like a good operator and a CEO and you put them in that position and you just sort of advise them? Or how does that kind of work? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things that we realized pretty early is most people um, who are great at ideas are terrible at execution or who are you know, terrible at ideas can be great at execution, but like, it's rare that you're good at both. It just like really is. And so why do you think that is? I mean, I think it's just like trying to find, like we were talking about, there's only so many people who are brilliant idea people like, you know, Steve Jobs or Elon Musk or, you know, Bezos who can talk about the future with confidence and actually believe it's going to be that way. And then also bring it back home and like look at metrics and, you know, operate and build the thing or, you know, a lot of the times those people, no one ever wants to work for them because they're neurotic and crazy, right? So they're just they're just rarely things that people are, are good at, um, that you're good at both of those. And so at Atomic, we kind of untangled that and said, we're going to start companies that we have high degree of confidence should be companies. And we're going to be that founder spirit and be like, this needs to exist. We're going to will it in the world. And then we're going to go find the best repeat execution operators in the country that we can find and strap them into like a rocket ship of an idea and build it together. Um, 
And I think that's worked really well for the companies. They've grown very, very fast. And it's, it's very unique to the traditional startup mentality that it has to be like somebody's baby and there's passion project that then turns into the big company. Um, it kind of like untangles, I think, that misconception and, and says there's ways to build really impactful companies in other ways. Mm-hmm. So, Andrew, when it comes to, you know, Hims and Hers, uh, the company that you're currently the founder and CEO of, was that one of the companies that was born out of Atomic or was that a completely separate project that, you know, you launched and ran with? It, it was. It was one of the ideas that we had within the fund. Uh, which was this idea that, you know, it is crazy in modern times that you can't pick up your phone and get access to healthcare. Like in every other part of our life, we can pick up our phone, food gets delivered, a car shows up, we can buy clothes, we can buy tickets to something, we can Google search anything. But in healthcare, we have to wait three or four weeks for an appointment. We have no idea how much it's going to cost. We have no idea who we're going to talk to. We don't know what they're going to treat us with. We don't know if it's safe. We have no options. We have no choice, right? And so I think this idea was, hey, we believe that in the next 10, 20 years, healthcare is going to look a lot more like a consumer brand and a consumer company than it does today. And so we're going to go build that. Um, and I think it was entirely out of you know, need and necessity for ourselves and our friends and family. Right. And that access to healthcare thing is such a broad sort of idea. And so I know you guys started more, a little more niche. And so kind of walk us through how, how you decided, all right, this is the vision that we see, but this is what we're going to start with and what that was and how you got it sort of going. Yeah. I mean, the, the strategy was actually really simple, um, which was if you want to build the future system of healthcare, you have to build a product and a brand that the future healthcare participants love. And when you think about who those future people are, it's people that are in their teens and their twenties and their thirties. Right. And most of the time in healthcare and, and in most businesses, people think, you know, let's go build the product for the money spenders today. And in healthcare, those are people in their fifties and sixties. But if you go talk to people in their sixties today about what they want from healthcare, it looks very different from what the 20 year old kid expects from healthcare. Right. And so we saw that discrepancy taking place. And so much of it is because there's been this rapid technology change where like 20 year olds grew up with iPhones and six year olds didn't. Right. So we just said, we want to build the future healthcare system in order to do that. We need to build it for what this young demographic wants and expects. And when you talk to those people, you know, you learn about things like hair loss and you learn about things like acne and things like sexual issues with their partner, or self-confidence issues, anxiety and depression, right? Those, those are the things that people in their twenties are struggling with. And so that was where we, where we put our original focus and, and built for them. Andrew, I know this is about to be a loaded question, but you know, why the hell does healthcare in America suck so much? I mean, to, for, for people like you and so many others to say, it's time to innovate, right? I mean, it's amazing that we have entrepreneurs that have the viewpoint that you do that health will eventually be, you know, in the hands of, you know, the consumers and it will have consumer brands and products. But why did it have to get this bad? Why did it have to get this bad for people to say, you know, shit, we should launch Ritual. We should launch Hims and Hers. We should launch Forward and all these other health Mm. tech and telemedicine type companies to serve the consumers. Is it the country's fault, the government's fault, or is it more so consumers and their progress as technology continues to progress? You know, I I think it's, I think it's both. Um, The last 10 years has created an explosion of uh, technology that has fundamentally changed how healthcare can work. You know, you can pick up your phone and you can talk about, uh, you know, melasma and you can literally show in real time the doctor the thing on your face and that's the same as them in person right right? you've got an apple watch that's showing you your blood pressure and your oxygen levels right at home so you've got at home monitoring you've got the ability to live stream video photos you know document e-prescribe have medication shipped to your home all of this stuff is new right Mm -hmm. so it's, it's unfair to say that 
it's the government and its regulators that have caused, you know, 50, 60 years of, of issues. Um, now, I do think in the last 10 years, regulation and entrenched interests have made it really hard to innovate, <clears throat> right? Things like telemedicine were not legal 10 years ago, right? Teladoc had to sue the state of Texas to make it legal because so many entrenched interests were saying, we don't want this. We want to protect the existing system. We're making a ton of money off of it, right? And you've got pharmaceutical companies today still right, lobbying against progressive reform to make access you know, more affordable because they're making so much money off of it and they have right. for so long. And so there are hurdles that are regulatory hurdles, lobbying hurdles, because the entrenched interests are so strong and so powerful. Um, but I think the technology that's, you know, come to, to pass in the last decade has made it so much, so much more obvious that it's needed to change that now regulation and everything is just catching up really quickly. Right. And the interesting thing about innovation, and I actually re recently, like last year, read a book about um, this is like, people don't, th people think it's like one technology or one thing that, you know, it's accelerating to that point, but it's more like as, as technology gets, you know, more quicker and just adaptive um it's it's actually the convergence of multiple things and so that's in just a, if you're looking at kind of where the future is going you have to look at multiple factors and not just one industry or one piece of technology right and so i guess in in your case you know um you mentioned you finding all these different issues early on that came to whether, whether it's hair loss or you know sexual or, or different things that you decided this is how we're going to start how did you go about that did you have to just kind of do a lot of different focus groups or interviews or how did you know what you were building yeah you you know the the first <clears throat> the first thing you need to figure out is who you're building for right and so for us we said we're going to take this bet we want to we want to go big for this business. We want to build the future of healthcare. So we need to go find that twenty year old kid who, in twenty years from now, is going to be the person that is spending the most money in healthcare. And then we need to go fully understand everything they worry about, everything they care about, the things they expect, how much money they have, etc. So we literally, you know, <laughs> would talk with hundreds of these people. We do focus groups. We talk to our buddies. We would do surveys. We'd create fake websites and drive Facebook ads to it, you know, that were messaging different things at different price points. And then we'd look at the data. Okay, who came through this one? Oh, man, this is all 50-year-old women that came through this one. Oh, 20-year-old men came through this one. You know, how did they convert differently to be able to get an idea of, like, who is this person? Who are these men? Who are these women? What do they care about? How much money do they have? What are the things that are must-haves versus not must-haves? Um, what are the few things that like we need to nail to resonate with them? Um, and that probably took, you know, I don't know, probably two years of research before even, you know, starting to build anything with, with hims and hers. And did you have to like self fund through your own fund or did you think, out, go out and just raise money, money from the get go? Cause mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming at some point you get to a point where you, you realize, all right, now we got to go and create these formulas or, you know, if it's like, you know, actual tablets or whatever we're selling, we have to go out and create this. So we need money to do that. Yeah. So we self-funded it through the fund for, you know, 50 K or hundred K um, all of the tests, all the prototypes, you know, for six months or whatever it was. And then when we got enough data and felt good enough about what we were doing, we then went out to a couple close friends who were VCs that knew, you know, that were experts in the things we needed to be experts in. You know, so you're talking about Kirsten Green at Forerunner, who's one of the best people at brands in the country. Um, and then we went over and, and we're with Josh Kushner in New York, who's one of the best people at building uh, commerce, direct to consumer businesses, right? He's been in things like Harry's and Warby Parker and all those businesses. Um, so we kind of, we like aggregated our superhuman team after we realized what were the superhuman skills we would need. Um, and we had all the data about what this thing had to look like. And that's when we started to raise. We raised just a few million bucks uh, and started to build the thing. So, Andrew, I know that, you know, HIMS and I know HIMS and HERS uh, connects patients to healthcare professionals, right? To licensed healthcare professionals. But more than that, you know, if somebody looks up what you guys offer, it's a whole variety of products that, you know, before 
you couldn't really get those things online. You'd have to go to like a Rite Aid or CVS before that, save on drugs or whatever, you know, became part of Albertsons. Uh, and obviously, you know, you have this awesome branding that is very focused and very targeted towards, I assume, millennials and Gen Z, right? You know, how has the business grown over the last few years? I know we'll talk about, you know, this past few months, but in the last three, four years since launching HIMSS, you know, as the founder, as the CEO, what have you seen in terms of growth and some of the challenges that you've had to deal with uh, throughout it all? You know, we've had a um, <clears throat> we've had a really unique, I think, three four years. You know, having built companies for fifteen years, um, the Hims and her story is a special story. It's not it's not totally playbook. And what what I mean by that is when we launched the company. Um, it was obvious that we had created something people really, really wanted, right? We were doing hundreds of orders a day. Everything we had built was breaking. Our pharmacy partners were breaking. Our customer support team was breaking. Our engineering, our website was breaking. I mean, it, it was one of those things where we had nailed the customer insight and the research process that by the point we actually went live, it, it was there. It was at product market fit. That doesn't mean that it was ready to scale. I mean, that's when everything started to, that's when it all ha- had to start happening. But we knew that customers loved it and wanted it. Yeah. So what you can know, you attribute had- that though? Besides obviously, you know, just, I mean, creating a product that people just needed, but how did you get mm-hmm. it to them from the get go? And in that early first week, two weeks, like how did um, all these people find out about it to then actually prove out that there's a product product market fit here? Yeah, you know, there was this like, uh, there was a thesis that I had that if you could make some of these topics in healthcare that most people never wanted to talk about, if you could make them something people would want to talk about, it would have like amplification effects that would be exceptionally valuable to the business. Um, Because you're like flipping something that's stigmatized on its head. And then all of a sudden everyone's talking about it. So we had a lot of conversations, a lot of, a lot of design strategies around how do we build this thing so that when it launches, people want to talk about it. Um, So we did New York city subway takeover stations, you know, in the, in the subways, we did banner ads, we did uh, bus stop takeovers, we did podcasts um, all with this really authentic, real, pretty, um, direct, blunt, and in a lot of ways, you know, uh, you know, humorously inappropriate type uh, content, because we wanted to say, hey, things that are stigmatized, like sex issues, or acne, or hair loss, we're going to actually make hilarious topics of conversations for people. Because we knew that at the core, all of our customers were worried about these things, having done research for all these men, we all knew that we all worried about it. We just needed to figure out what the catalyst was for people to talk about it. And, and I think that was a huge part of how we built this brand and how we got people to know about it was just finding that insight about the fact that stigma was a big reason why people weren't getting treated and we needed to break that stigma. Andrew, one of the things that you mentioned, which I thought was really interesting, was the fact that things were like breaking, right? Uh, I know, uh, I forget his name off the top of my head, but the YC... Combinator founder, whose name Paul Graham. Paul Graham, exactly. Thanks, Pat. Who's slipping my mind there? Um, said like, just start to build something that doesn't scale, and then when you need to scale, figure out how to scale. What I'm hearing from you is just start building something, get to a point where things start breaking, and then figure out how to scale. Right? When shit hit the fan, when things started breaking, you know, as the founder, as the CEO, how did you say, okay, now we got to figure things out? Right now, we've proven that this thing is a need. People want this stuff. Where do we take it from there? You know, what was the next step once you guys hit that, you know, breaking point, if you want to call it that? You know, I, I think uh, I think the ideal position a startup is in is always finding new territories that are breaking the business because it's unlocking more and more demand that you aren't quite ready to support. Right, And it's a really stressful situation to be in. But if you can actually be in that stressful situation all the time, 
you will succeed much faster than anybody else. Mm. So we have made it our, you know, lifeblood to get comfortable being wildly uncomfortable at him's and hers. So things are always breaking in our company um, because I am pushing the team to always find new territories, new avenues of growth and catch up, having our team be always catching up to the customer demand. And I think, you know, the, the, you know, Bezos put out this letter, you know, it's always day one. It's always like that day one of entrepreneurship and innovation in a company. And you got to like keep that culture for as long as possible. And to me, the manifestation of that is always trying things and having them not necessarily be scalable, but, but find things that break the system and then go catch up to them. And so we are always finding this balance of delivering incredibly high quality healthcare, which is, you know, can't break. That has to be high quality and safe always, but also pushing the boundaries of going faster and finding new things people want and need. You know, earlier you talked about having sort of these leadership qualities and experiences when you were younger, like in high school and college. Um, When it came down to you know, becoming, I guess, you know, uh, so when you started Hems, you became the CEO, you know, you had other companies that you were incubating sort of under Atomic, but I assume that you decided we're going to become C, I'm going to become CEO of this because it's just growing so fast and I want to, you know, um, take this all the way. And so what were some of those early things, you know, for a high growth, fast growing startup that you learned as a leader that perhaps you didn't have before? Um, what are some of those early like learnings for you? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think the balancing, you know, I had never built a company at this point um, where you are achieving um, like massive financial metrics and growth. Uh, and then also then started bringing investors in that were expecting profitability. Right, like early startups, most of Silicon Valley, you know, the money and the time is spent on that early seed round and that early A round, right? And that's what people always talk about. And that's what I knew. And so I think the last three and four years to me has been this incredible learning experience of how you build a fast growing company while building entrenched compounding benefits that make it also a really freaking good company too. Like a high margin company, a high recurability company a company whose cohorts are getting better, whose margins are awesome, that lets you reinvest cash to grow. Like I had just never done that before. Um, And I'm not sure that I, I'm not sure in the beginning, I knew the actual value of getting good at that. Um, Now, you know, I think it's the thing I spend all my time on is like how you um, continue to tell this beautiful story of the vision while also building an incredible company underneath the hood um, and I think Hims and hers was really the first company that had scaled to the point where, you know, when you're raising $200 million, $300 million, the, the types of questions people ask you is no longer the types of questions they ask you in the seed round, seed round or the A round, right? And I had to readjust my brain and surround myself with a new set of mentors who, who were used to that and who could train me and could get me up to speed really quickly. So, Andrew, I know that you're officially a public company CEO, uh, which, you know, uh, you could tell us offline whether or not that's a that's a cool thing or not, uh, but or off or online, whatever you prefer. Um, but, you know, you did it in a very interesting way. Right. And it's something that's been coming up a lot recently, which is the SPAC, the special purpose acquisition company, I believe is what it stands for. And we know a lot of companies that we've talked to recently that have gone that route. Um, you know, what motivated or inspired you to take Hims public in the first place? Uh, you know, so why'd you do it essentially? And why the route that you decided to take? Yeah, you know, I think the, the first question for me in the last couple of years is, um, is it advantageous for us to build this company in a, in a private world or as a public company? And I think I have maybe a, a unique opinion right now that building in the public markets is maybe one of the best advantages you can have for a company that's trying to build something that's 10, 20 year vision, right? And and I think a lot of people forget, frankly, that some of the best companies in the world went public just a few years after launch, right? Apple, Amazon, 
like Google, these companies went public three, four, five years after they were founded, right? They didn't wait 10, 20 years in the private markets. And so for me, you know, the reason to go public was um, first and foremost, I was confident in where the business was at today, right? It was stable enough. Um, it was predictable enough. We had uh, helped millions of people across every state in this country. I felt confident in the platform and the business we had. Um, I felt confident in the business metrics we had. So I think that was kind of a table stakes question. And then the second was, I actually think there's a real advantage to building in the public markets because as a public market investor myself, I don't see businesses like him's and hers in the public markets. And I would love to invest in a company like mine in the public markets, right? In the last 10 years, all of the growth has been kept out of the public markets and been kind of maintained in the private markets. So everyone's just investing in like the Vanguard 500 and Netflix and Tesla and Facebook and Google because there's nothing else. Like there's really nothing interesting else happening. And so, you know, if somebody came to me and said, hey, I can let you invest in a company that's going after the future of an industry that's about to completely change over the next 10 years. They're three years in, it's 90% recurring revenue, it's 76% high margin growth, it's growing you know, 50, 100% year over year. What do you think? I, you know, I'd be like, here's my money, let's go. Right? <laughs> so I think just as an objective outside party, I was like, I, I think this story resonates and I think it will also teach us, which I think is really valuable, how to find that balance of the reality distortion we talked about and painting the vision to public market investors, which for this company, there's a huge vision, but also then being able to go back internally in my team and be like, how are we going to hit this quarter and make sure that next quarter is easier to hit and the quarter after that's even better to hit, right? Like, how do you find that balance of growth and optimization and vision storytelling? And I think if we can get good at that, it sets you up really well to build something that, you know, 50, $100 billion market cap in the next 10, 20 years is, is achievable. I think um, part of this, uh, Pasha's second question too was, um, why did you decide to take the SPAC route as opposed to like a direct listing or an IPO? Yeah, you know, for, for that question, it was really just a question of which structure was most advan advantaged for us, right? It, it wasn't some crazy strategic debate it's, it's just going public, you have a few different options, right? You could go public through a traditional IPO, which takes 12 months or 18 months. Um, you're going to have a whole bunch of bankers involved. They're probably going to price you really low. And then there's going to be 100% pop the day of the IPO, which in reality is pretty much like the most expensive marketing, marketing you could ever have, because that just means you price the deal wrong. And you as a founder are taking a huge amount of dilution. Mm -hmm. you know, then there's direct listings where you don't raise any capital. Um, and then there's these SPAC structures, which from our standpoint had a lot of advantages. It was a much quicker process. You know, we could get it done in four to six months, which for me, if I'm talking about my time and my management time, my management team's time away from the business, you know, four months is way better than 12 months from a distraction cost standpoint. Um, and so I think there's, efficiency dynamics with the SPAC. I think there were great flexibility dynamics. We were able to raise a pipe, which allowed us to select certain institutional funds like Franklin Templeton to get, a, get into our, our cap table. So it really was just like a, a pros and cons list between all the options once we were ready to go public. Um, and ultimately, I think the SPAC process, even though it's relatively new, um, it had a lot of benefits that we, we, really, we really felt were powerful. Yeah, and, and and honestly, my opinion in this case is like I think you're one of the early. It, it it is relatively new in terms of the popularity, but it's been around for a long time. Um, but like the because of the popularity, I think there's going to be a lot of innovation in this um in this arena with the whole going public model, yeah. which I think you're like one of the early adopters in that. Um, you know, you guys and obviously a few others that have gone public via SPAC in the last you know year or two. Um, and so I'm I'm personally really excited to see where things go with with that process because like you said, you know, we're we're seeing even companies that are massive companies that are doing a lot in revenue and are very profitable are leaving a lot of money on the table going through the traditional IPO route, um, which is, it sucks. I mean, it sucks for the owners of the company and, and the yeah. founders. I mean, if you, if people were to ask you a question like, you know, are you surprised that an old system that's really expensive and really slow is trying to be innovated on? Like, like no, you're not surprised. Like the traditional IPO process, like 
is not a particularly friendly process, right? It's really expensive. It's got to really- go on a road show. Yeah, you go on these road shows. The banks make a ton of money. I mean, it's it's a <laughs> it's a really fairly inefficient, broken system. And so, right. no surprise that people who are first principle thinkers are looking at other structures and other venues and, and ways to get the same goal accomplished. Right, and, and Andrew, I guess to that point, you know, I was following your journey with Hims all along for the past few years, and uh, I know that you guys ended up going with. Uh, Oak Tree Acquisition Corporation as the SPAC vehicle, I, I, I suppose that's what they call it, yep. to merge with to go public. You know, I'm curious, how does that process look like? Do you approach the SPAC or does the SPAC approach you? Right? I mean, I, like that's what, one thing I've been wondering because now they can wear the egg. <laughs> yeah, I mean, these days it sounds like I'm the only one that doesn't have a SPAC yet. Uh, but who who's starting that relationship? You know, it it probably depends on who you are as a company. Um, You know, I think for us, a lot of people knew Hims and Hers as a story. It's a consumer brand that, you know, we've got TV commercials with Snoop Dogg and J-Lo. You know, people know about the company. And so um, I think it attracted a lot of SPAC teams that were looking at targets. Um, So in the last year and two, you know, we had a lot of teams reach out and, and try to kind of court the company and talk about going public and what it could look like. Um, and I think, you know, ultimately we decided to go uh, that path and specifically with Oak Tree, you know, because the team we felt was just a, a uniquely talented team. You've got Howard Marks, you know, running that organization, who's one of the best investors in history. Um, you know, you've got a, a team that has capital markets expertise, unlike you know, most organizations. And so we felt like they were pretty unique. We felt like they're, what they offered was unique. We enjoyed working with them. Um, and so, you know, it kind of came in through a warm introduction and, and through getting to know each other after a few months, it was a pretty obvious decision for us. You know, you mentioned growing up in San Francisco, Silicon Valley and building your company in Silicon Valley. And I, I'm curious, you know, with what we've seen during this pandemic and sort of the, 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 not the exodus, but it's basically what it is like people moving around and, you know, this like whole idea that Silicon Valley is no longer Silicon Valley. I'm curious to hear your thoughts of, on if you think where you are and where you've built your company is still the best place to start a company and grow it, or if it's not what you think is happening in this whole space. Um, you know, if I, if I was recommending, a location to start a company as a founder, there is no question in my mind that the Bay Area is the best place to be. Um, mm-hmm. No question. Uh, you know, you are surrounded by a culture, um, I think, of winning in, in, in startups. And that is powerful. You're learning from people that have succeeded at different stages. <clears throat> and you're jumping over things that others might fall into traps you might fall into. So I do think that culture in that ecosystem and high concentration of um, expertise in a, in a small area actually is really valuable. I mean, there's a reason that that there's so much concentration in one area. Now, does that mean that you shouldn't then have a remote culture where you're hiring the best talent from around the country? Absolutely. You should absolutely be doing that, right? I think the the best talent is everywhere. So finding those engineers in Canada, finding those supply chain people in Ohio, finding the marketers and designers in New York, right? Finding the engineers in Tennessee and Atlanta, whatever it is, like build your SWAT team of excellence from around the country and around the world. But if you're talking about being a founder surrounded by other founders and VC is raising money and understanding their expectations. There's no, there's no place better than here. Um, mm. And I think, I think what is happening right now is, um, you know, people for, for a lot of different reasons want to, you know, try new places and try new cities. And a lot of that is because of taxes, right? Like there's a lot of other places in this country that have uh, better tax rates. There's a lot of other places in this country that have better, um, political dynamics that people align with there's better weather in different places in this country especially right now so some parts of the year some parts of the year <laughs> i don't know i think we've got this really freak black swan situation with covid where everyone's like hey for the next year or two 
I can be a nomad and live anywhere. So yeah, you know, F San Francisco, I'm going to go try someplace new. Do I think that fundamentally changes the value that this Bay Area has when it comes to being a founder? Absolutely not. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, everything always reverts to the mean. and, And I do think it's a unique place. Now, I hope that the locations also become valuable because it will just accelerate innovation for the country and the world. So in no way do I think San Francisco is the only place it can happen. But if I were to say to a founder, you know, you're going to give yourself one shot to have the cards stacked in your, in your favor, you know, I think being in this area definitely helps stack it. So, Andrew, just to kind of start wrapping things up, I think, you know, you bring up COVID, you know, a word I hate, you know, a lot um, and hate talking about it too all the time. Uh, But there's obviously no doubt that, you know, a lot of businesses have done significantly better as a result of COVID. I assume HIMSS and a lot of other, um, you know, telemedicine, telehealth companies are kind of in that same kind of boat when it comes to the growth that they've seen, you know, but for COVID, uh, you know, let's say COVID is all said and done. We're finally done with this thing. Everybody's vaccinated, you know, whatever la la land world we live in, you know, do, you know, companies like him's and obviously does him's continue to grow? Has consumer behavior changed enough for things to kind of continue on a steady growth? Yeah. You know, I think the, the beautiful things about him's and hers and, and all of this stuff is public. You can see it uh, in all of our financial disclosures is, Year over year since we've launched this business, the core metrics are just continuing to get better, right? Revenue is going up steadily. Margins are continuing to expand. Product expansion continues to happen. There was no outlier situation that took place for us as a business when it came to COVID, right? It wasn't like 2020 hit and all of a sudden our business 5 x right, from this unique situation and boom, we're like this big business. Actually, it was pretty much the opposite, right? Our business has been really linear and consistent uh, growth throughout that that period. So I do think for some businesses, you know, clearly in telemedicine, it had that explosive dynamic. And, and, and I think a lot of habits have changed where, you know, two years ago, nobody had heard about telemedicine. And now almost the entire country has experienced it. Right. So those types of trends will continue. And telemedicine is so much better than going in person and waiting in a doctor's office that no one's going to opt to like go do that again when they know they can just pick up their phone from their couch, talk to a doctor in a minute and get the medicine they need delivered to their door. Mm. So, you know, that that behavioral change has without question changed for the for the good and for the future. Um, But I think we're actually a unique company where uh, our business has been pretty, pretty much steady. Um, steady as it goes and, and hasn't seen big ups and downs as a result of COVID, uh, thankfully. I know we talked a lot about like direct to consumer and, you know, B2C, et cetera, when it comes to this space. But I also see that there's a huge opportunity from the B2B aspect, right? Do you think or do you see or have you already planned for hims and hers to almost infiltrate and uh, revolutionize that market because i see that the greatest innovation needs to happen there i mean yeah. you know, i work for an employer so i get insurance you know through my company etc i think there's a lot of innovation that's needed in in that area i mean what is yeah. hims and hers going to be doing when it comes to that yeah it's a great question you know the the f- an interesting stat about our business that the majority of patients that come to us every day and we power thousands of visits a day um they have insurance they have corporate insurance, right? They have th- they have offerings like Teladoc, for example, right. already. Their businesses are paying for them, yet those people are coming to him's and hers and paying cash, 20 bucks. Um, and the reason is because, as you said, the existing offerings and insurance and benefits that people have are not great, right? It's like wildly complex to understand what's covered, what's not covered. People have really high deductible insurance plans where like, just going to see a doctor could cost 50 bucks cash, right? On average, it's like $2,000 deductible for an individual in this country. That means they have to be spending like 200 bucks a month almost in cash before they even get the benefit of their insurance, right? And so <clears throat> the existing access that people have is not great access, like you said, and it's complicated. Mm-hmm. And even smart people don't know how to navigate it. 
Um, and so when you think about, you know, the average person in this country being able to figure out great healthcare, it's impossible. And so when I think about broadening hims and hers, I do think about how you bundle this to businesses. How do you make what we've built more accessible to people? Um, how do you partner with insurance companies? How right. do you, you know, how do you make it something that is even cheaper for people to access and even simpler? But I do think the best way to go about that is not building a business offering that businesses pay for and customers don't use, mm-hmm. right? The, like then you're just in the exact same old place that we've been for 20 years. The right. way you build that is building something customers love already. Mm-hmm. And then you go to the companies and say, hey, your employees already use this. They already love this. Now let's make it even better for them and you can get some benefits for it, right? You can make your employee pool happier and healthier and, and miss less work and be more efficient. And they're going to love you more because you now give them this benefit. That's how I think you do it. And I think that's kind of how we're, we're approaching it in the next few years. Yeah, nothing like creating some good old leverage. That's right. <laughs> well, Andrew, I think uh, I speak for both of us when I say this has been uh, just like a super enjoyable conversation. Uh, Posh, I don't know if you have any other questions, but uh, we can't thank you enough for hanging out with us and sharing your story and wisdom with us. And, um, you know, excited to see what happens next, not just with you guys, but this whole industry. Um, there's a lot of exciting innovations coming and uh, we, we can't wait to see it. But hopefully we can meet in person someday once this whole thing is done. And uh, thank you. Uh, thanks. Thanks. Thanks a lot. I would love that. And thank you for having me on.